Please join me in welcoming Dr. James Lennon. Pleasure being here. I'm uh, really excited about talking to everyone about uh, probably the biggest question of all. Uh, when I was younger, growing up, I was inspired by watching people actually walking on the moon, the surface of the moon, another world. Totally inspiring. Not just to be an astronomer, but just to be a piece of a civilization. I look around now, and I don't see that inspiration. I don't see people being inspired by these amazing things. We haven't been back to the moon in the 70s. Uh, so we seem to be at a crossroads, some type of crossroads, where we're not really looking at the future of life here on Earth. We're looking sort of, we're just sort of staying in the pack. This is the pale blue dot. Many of you may have remembered, uh, may, may remember Carl Sagan, a great astronomer and physicist who took a Voyager spacecraft as it was passing the orbit of Jupiter, turned around and looked back and imaged the Earth, and it appeared as a pale blue dot in a sunbeam. This pale blue dot was actually the planet Earth. Everybody you've ever known, ever studied, ever read about, in fact, every life form we ever know about, have ever known about, right here on this one planet Earth. That's it. NASA uh, was the agency that did all the exploration, or has been doing all the space exploration for us. When it was created, it was not a military thing. It was, they, whenever they got a discovery, they gave it immediately to every citizen of the, of the world, not just the United States. It was a, a very open thing. That's an amazing thing about NASA, is none of it is prioritized, none of it is kept in. They use it for the good of all mankind. I watch people walk on the surface of another planet. I talk to students every day, and a lot of people don't believe we ever did that, because we haven't been back there since the 70s. You know the computers on those uh, landers had about 200 kilobytes of memory. Yes, I said kilobytes. I didn't say megabytes, gigabytes, or terabytes. I said kilobytes. With that technology, they were able to land people on the moon and bring them back safely many, several times. Why haven't we gone back to the moon? I don't know. It's amazing. During that time, we were, when we went home, we got to turn on television and watch Star Trek, one of my favorite series of all time, as you might imagine. <laughs> Those were a group of people who were explorers. They weren't military people, really. They had phasers on their ship and everything, but that was purely for defense. They were out exploring. That's what humans do. That's what our civilization is about, is exploration. And that's one thing that we seem to be really missing. Carl Sagan. Again, a lot of my students don't know who Carl Sagan is, and it just so I have to show a Carl Sagan video every time I teach astronomy, because just the way he presented the material to the general public was amazing. It actually educated people. When he put on a, his Cosmos show and wrote his books, he educated everybody, regardless of where they were, what their politics were, anything. He just wanted people to know about the universe we live in. Amazing person. When I was growing up back in the 70s, I had it all planned out for the human race. I thought we were going to have moon bases. I thought people would be living on the moon doing scientific research. I thought we'd be going to Mars and walking around on the surface and exploring with people. Back in the 70s, we soft landed the, the, some of the spacecraft on the surface of Mars. And now, just a few months ago, we actually soft landed Curiosity on Mars. Everybody was so excited. We soft landed this craft, this little rover on Mars. We did that back in 1970 when I was in high school. <laughs> yeah? And we're excited about it now. We've missed the boat. We've missed the crossroads. I thought we'd have spacecraft that could go to the outer parts of the solar system and beyond and take people out there. Techno Technology-wise, it's well within our grasp. The question is, why haven't we done it? Now, we've done some good things. This is Space Telescope. You might recognize that. Space Telescope has really opened our eyes, literally, to the wonders of the universe, all the things that are out there. Uh, we're not, we want to explore the universe, we want to find out what it holds out there for us because the more we know about the universe, we, the more we know about right here. This is a picture from Hubble Space Telescope, this is the Eagle Nebula. This nebula basically allows us to see star formation regions, literally stellar nurseries. Now we know the sun isn't forever, 
it formed at one point. This is a stellar nursery of sun, stars just like the sun is forming. The sun will die at some point. Regardless of whether humans are here on the planet Earth or not, the sun will die at some point. That's a fact. And astronomy tells us that. We've seen some amazing things out in the universe. This is a relativistic jet that extends out thousands of light years away from the, in the center of a galaxy. None of the best, most imaginative science fiction writers could even think of anything like that. But yet, we find it there all over the place in the universe. So, by studying the universe, we learn about what happens here, how we got here, and where we're going with this life. This is another great picture. Everybody's seen a full moon. Raise your hand if you've ever seen a full moon. Okay, some people actually raised their hand. I can't believe that. Uh, full moon. But you see the little square in the lower left? That's the field of view of the Hubble Space Telescope. And if we blow that up, this is the universe that we see. All of those little splotches and colors on there, except for the one with the little crosses through there, are distant galaxies. Distant galaxies containing millions and billions of stars. So if you see the one with a little cross on there, imagine you're looking through a window, and the little cross one is dirt on the window. Everything else is way beyond in the, in the distance. So all those galaxies are out there in the distance, millions and billions of stars, planets, who knows? Maybe even life out there. We've never detected any, but it's possible. Right now, as I look around, I mentioned that we're at a crossroads. Uh, it looks really bleak. Uh, not only is funding for education down, the university system in Florida has lost, uh, has been underfunded by about a billion dollars since 2005. NSF funding is going down. They're actually considering closing national observing facilities like Kitt Peak National Observatory. Now, why should that, why, why should you really care about that? We're not going to get pretty pictures, right? No big deal. Actually, there's a project on that mountain called Space Watch. Space Watch is actually mapping out the inner solar system for Earth-crossing asteroids. These Earth-crossing asteroids might be the end of all life on Earth, not just humans, but all life on Earth. If NSF funding drops so much that they turn loose these telescopes, put them in mothballs, who's going to be watching for that asteroid that's going to collide with Earth? And if you don't think that's possible, just ask the dinosaurs. Oh yeah, you can't, they're all dead. <laughs> The NASA Brain Trust is being disseminated, layoffs like crazy. You can't recover from something like this so easily. It's not like everybody just goes away and, oh, we want to send a spacecraft to Mars, and everybody who knows how to do it comes back, because they've got, they've got other jobs now. And the budget cuts are tearing NASA apart. No real miss missions. The space shuttle, their museum articles now, they're not spacecraft anymore. We've got a space station we can't even send people up to right now. The James Webb Space Telescope? No, it's not named after me. I wish I could say it were, but it's not. Its uh, funding is literally year by year. It's been used in the halls of Congress, basically, for battles. It's been like a volleyball, tossing it back and forth. We're going to fund it. No, we're not going to fund it. What's this telescope going to do? It's going to make Hubble look like a toy. It's going to be out beyond the orbit of, of the moon. It's going to be looking deeper into space and deeper back into time uh, than any telescope ever. It's going to reveal a universe that we can only imagine right now. But its funding is a political toy. Again, why is this stuff really important to life here on Earth? I mean, there are lots of other things like poverty, things like that going on here on Earth. Well, this is a picture of Venus. Venus is actually a twin of the Earth about the same size, about the same mass, not that much closer to the sun than we are. It should be a pretty nice planet to go to for a vacation. Maybe a little warmer, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, its atmosphere is 90 times thicker than the Earth's atmosphere. Temperatures are about 900 degrees Fahrenheit, and the clouds, sulfuric and hydrofluoric acid. And you say, well, what happened to Venus? Well, the answer is, as Carl Sagan proved, the greenhouse effect. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere holds the heat in, heated up the atmosphere so all the acids boiled out of the rocks, and now the atmosphere is intolerable. Could that happen here? Absolutely. Especially as we pump greenhouse gases into our own atmosphere. So by studying planets, we study what we shouldn't do to our own planet. So it's a way of planetary stewardship. I told you about collisions before in the Space Watch watching out for Earth-crossing asteroids. You may think, oh, not a big deal. Really, it is. 
Uh, last year, you probably woke up one morning and a large asteroid passed between the orbit of the Earth and the Moon, and you didn't even know it. Astronomers didn't even know it until it was on its way out. If that asteroid would have hit Earth, you would have known it. This is the planet Jupiter. And you see those black things in the atmosphere? They're about the size of the Earth. This was caused by Comet Shoemaker Levy 9. Jupiter's gravity grabbed Comet Shoemaker Levy 9, pulled it apart into individual pieces. These pieces entered the atmosphere and left ashes in the atmosphere about the size of the Earth. Shoemaker Levy 9 would hit Earth again. We wouldn't be here talking about it. So what really gets me is that there are long lines for iPhone 5s. Everybody has to have the new latest iPhone. The newest video game. The newest games. If funding goes into building technology just to entertain ourselves, who's going to be watching out for the asteroids? Everybody's going to be sitting there. Who's going to inspire our, our young to become astronomers, to become scientists, to basically make ourselves global citizens again? So that's the big question, and that's the crossroads we're at. Where are we going from here with our civilization? Instead of turning on the TV and watching Survivor Philippines or some other version of Survivor, it literally could be Survivor Earth. Who's going to survive uh, when global warming takes over, Florida's underwater, a large asteroid impacts, you get tsunamis. Who's going to survive? So again, I take you back to the universe. The answers and questions are out there. We're explorers. We've always been explorers. And we can't be one planet wonders, because one planet wonders don't last very long in this business. So we have to go out there. We have to take the right path in this crossroads. Right now, it seems like we're going downwards. We're going back into our shell. We need to go up. We need to fund education. We need to make sure NASA stays healthy and is able to do the things they need to do. We need to fund research. We need to inspire our children to learn about the universe and not just be content with video games and iPhones. Thank you.